Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Joining us today is Marion Tupi, editor of humanprogress.org and a senior policy analyst at the Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity at the Cato Institute. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Marion. Thank you for having me. Why start humanprogress.org? Um, well, it had uh, many causes, uh, but the uh, let, let me focus on three. Uh, first was the a great recession, um, the financial crisis of 2008. And uh, the newspapers were filled with stories like uh, Washington Post um, carried a headline, is this the end of American capitalism? The New York Times had a very famous contribution from Tom Friedman, should we be China for a day? Uh, in other words, liberal democracy itself was being questioned. And uh, it seemed to me that part of the reason why people were uh, so willing to talk about the demise of capitalism and liberal democracy was because uh, they didn't quite appreciate uh, the tremendous accomplishments of liberal democracy and uh, free market capitalism, uh, basically the spread of uh, economic and political freedom over the last uh, 200 years or so. I'm talking about political and economic freedom in its broadest sense. The second reason was that I read um, Matt Ridley's Rational Optimist. Uh, the book was filled with very interesting uh, statistics that were new to me, such as the cost of light, which I later found out was uh, based on the famous Nordhaus paper from 1998 that I didn't know about and everybody should know about. So it seemed to me, so why not put it online? Uh, because um, uh, because uh, we wanted to really democratize access to information. And the third and last uh, point I would mention is that big data became, uh, first of all, freely available for the first time and the graphics uh, uh, revolution was advanced to a point where uh, big data could now be uh, readily uh, readily made available. And the amazing thing is uh, Matt Ridley's newest book, uh, which was The Evolution of Everything, he mentions that when an idea is ripe, a lot of people will come up with it. And as it turns out, 2013 also marked the launch of Gapminder online by Hans Rosling and his team, and also Max Roser's uh, Our World in Data. So they all, th three people in different parts of the world had, had a very similar idea. The first of the three that you mentioned, um, you, you talked about articles about is this the end of capitalism and then Tom Friedman's yearning for a totalitarian <laughs> regime that could, I think it was institute green energy policies without worrying about this fussy democracy and whatnot. But in light of that, in light of that, that particular part of the motivation and that human progress is a project of the Cato Institute, does human progress have like a view or an ideological perspective or a policy goal? Like is mm. this a libertarian website trying to push libertarianism? Right. So we are very open about what we are doing on the about page. That's very important because so, so many times online you find uh, people saying, oh, well, you know, you are uh, in the pocket of big corporations or uh, the, the Koch brothers are paying your way and things like that. So we are very uh, clear about what we are doing and I'm going to get there in a second. Um, what I wanted to start with is to say, what do we think is the value added of human progress? And the value added of human progress, as I see it, is to contextualize human progress within the broader uh, framework of human freedom, right? So Max Roser and Our World in Data, uh, he's a great scholar, um, but his website is primarily about the data. He doesn't really go into what has brought all of these tremendous advancements in human well-being about. And I had a similar complaint about Hans Rosling, a great man who has accomplished much more than I could ever hope to accomplish. But again, if you're listening to him, um, good things happen, sort of they're they are like being pulled, uh, like uh, like rabbits being pulled out of, out of a hat. Uh, he doesn't contextualize it whatsoever. Now, I'm convinced that the spread of human uh, freedom, uh, political and economic, uh, played a very large part in uh, in what's been happening uh, essentially since the late 18th century. And um, so we are not, and I'm, now I'm finally getting to your question, so we are not explicitly libertarian, but we do encourage people to think about uh, the 
uh, about the roles of of economic and uh, political freedom. Um, the data itself, of course, is all produced by third parties. So we have nothing to do with with, with the data. Uh, when people interact with our data, it's the same way they would interact with the World Bank, the IMF, uh, with Eurostat, or what have you. Um, but then we also producing our own original context, content, content, and that is precisely where we try to put a, a sort of freedom uh, spin on it. But hopefully, in a in a uh, hopefully in a uh, uh, in a justifiable way. In other words, it, if there is a link between, say, um, increased intellectual freedom in Europe in late 18th century and greater scientific experimentation, which then leads to certain scientific improvements, such as discovery of the germ theory of disease. We think that there is a clear link between, for example, abandonment of, uh, of, uh, 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 of religious dogma and embrace of science, but embrace of science itself is a, is an, uh, is an, is a result of greater freedom. In what way? Can we expand on that a little bit? Is it just greater freedom to read, greater That's freedom right. to, I guess, religious freedom you know, in the sense of not having heresy laws or yes. blasphemy well, laws exactly or things right. like this? That's exactly right. So insofar as we can identify Western Europe in the uh, 18th century as being uh, crucial. Now, I'm not suggesting that th there weren't uh, technological, scientific, and cultural advancements in the Middle East, in uh, in uh, Asia, especially in China. Uh, but but certainly the Industrial Revolution, which marks the the break with uh, with the with the time of popery um, in in human. Um, in human history, um, is a Western European, uh, Western European phenomenon, and um, you can point to a lot of things which which happened before the Industrial Revolution, which increased uh, freedom of conscience um, in in Europe. Uh, certainly, the, the uh, discovery of uh, of printing press, uh, the spread of uh, uh, first the Bible, but also then uh, other texts throughout Europe. Um, also, I would say that uh, in addition to printing press, uh, it would be the fragmentation of the European political scene and the fact that you had much more of a, uh, a political and economic competition in Europe, uh, which then led to different city-states providing their citizens, their inhabitants, with different sets of political rights and responsibilities, and people could choose where to live in order to experience greater freedom. So that's why uh, you have so many thinkers of the Enlightenment ending up in Switzerland, for example, or in the Low Countries, is because that's where they were permitted to say more than they would be in their home countries. So, yeah. It also seems that you can connect it to economic growth in just personal wealth because in say the year 800 everyone basically except the ones living in the castles were farmers who were living lives of poverty and they had to they had to farm enough for them to eat in a day and it took a lot more work for them to do that so if you were the best uh, thinker of the time if you were a possible scientist or some sort of possible innovator innovator but you were out there farming because no one could produce enough economic surplus for you to uh, contribute without farming or if you were the best opera singer of the time or or any of those professions that contribute to arts and science and culture they don't seem would, wouldn't seem to arise if you're just doing subsistence level agriculture Yes, so freeing of uh, the labor from uh, from the land um, and the move of uh, European populace from the farm to the cities, which uh, then has its own positive effects, was was also important. But uh, um, no doubt that uh, political liberalization uh, was uh, and economic liberalization. Um, well, uh, let me put it to you this way. The rise of the bourgeoisie in uh, 18th century, uh, perhaps even s sooner, was kind of important um, because uh, you had this previously unknown 
uh, force being introduced into European politics. So between before then, you what you have is the aristocracy on top. Uh, you have the peasants um, at the bottom. Between 80 and 90 percent of the population are peasants, and then you have a tiny sliver of people in the middle who are the traders. Um, but then, uh, in 18th century, you do have the rise of the bourgeoisie, um, and uh, as these people become uh, uh, wealthier, they start to resent the fact that they are being taxed uh, without having any political representation. And um, so you could certainly say that uh, uh, economic empowerment of the bourgeoisie leads to um, political rights for the first time being uh, being uh, being given uh, or are being obtained by by the people in the middle. Yeah, I think that's part of it. So the the broad takeaway when one goes and visits humanprogress.org. Um, and clicks through on all the graphs and reads the articles, both the original content and you guys link to a lot of articles elsewhere that are kind of on brand, um, is this progress, is that the world is getting better. Um, and But that's not the way most people feel. You know, mo Most people, if you ask them like, is the world getting better? They'd say no. If you ask them in specific, you know, is the world getting safer? No. Are people getting healthier? No. Um, are we getting wealthier? No. Maybe the, some of the rich are, but everyone else is not. Um, and so on the one hand, is it is it actually the case that the world like as a whole, things are getting better? This is the story of broad human progress or I mean to ask maybe – to sound unfair, are you just kind of cherry picking the handful of of good things amidst all of this you know, terrible trends? Um, and if you're not, if the world actually is getting better, why are so many of us convinced that it's not? Well, let's start with the is the world, whole world getting better? Uh, unambiguously, yes. Um, the the list of things which are getting worse in the world. Are is much shorter than the list of things in which the world is getting better, and uh, that list, the the second list, includes the most important elements of human well-being that I think most reasonable people would agree on. First of all, we are living longer. As late as 1950, sorry, as late as 1900, in the richest countries in the world, life expectancy was below 50 years. Now it is 70 years globally. In other words. Uh, your median global citizen living living somewhere in Malaysia lives 20 years longer than uh, a Western European did 120 years ago. Uh, and in the West, life expectancy is 78 years or so, or 80. So life expectancy, we are living longer and most people tend to sort of cling onto their life um, as long as possible. That gives us an indication that people prefer to live than, than being dead. Um, uh, famine and uh, calorie intake. Today, in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the poorest continent in the world, people have access to equal number of calories that the Portuguese did in the early 1960s. So you and I, well, certainly me, I am old enough to remember in the early 1980s, the images from um, uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea and, uh, you know, we thought this was the future of humanity. It's not. Famine is gone from uh, uh, the world outside of war zones. 20% uh, of African women, a uh, recent Kenyan study showed, are obese. Now, I'm not saying that's a good thing. What I'm saying is that it's preferable to... To, to famine. Uh, we have 80% literacy. We have close to universal access to primary school. Um, women, uh, or rather girls and boys uh, attending primary school, we, all mo we, all we have a gender parity uh, for the first time in, in human history. Something like 70% of girls in Afghanistan now attend primary school, which is remarkable by itself. Um, what else? Um, we have a uh, decline in a uh, variety of, of uh, types of violence. Um, Steven Pinker of Harvard has a 800-page book devoted to showing how violence has decreased. And uh, we don't need to get into numbers. You just have to think about things which used to be normal parts of human existence, such as breaking people on the wheel, uh, quartering and uh, beheading your your uh, 
uh, uh, criminals in the middle of town, town squares. This is very unusual outside of Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, People used to engage in and and delight in a variety of cruel sports, um, nailing cats to wooden poles and uh, uh, bear beating and uh, yeah. lowering cats into into fires and things like that. Uh, people just didn't bears like cats much. And, they and really so didn't. Forth. Medieval people did not like cats. This is true. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, uh, oh, and uh, for the first time in recorded history, we don't have a hot international war between two countries that have declared war on each other. We have frozen conflicts, such as the US versus North Korea. Uh, we have clandestine, uh, or maybe not so clandestine, uh, invasion of Eastern Ukraine by Russia. But even there, um, uh, what is it that vice pays to virtue? Uh, hypocrisy is what the, the, the compliment that vice pays to virtue. Uh, even there, um, uh, Putin has not uh, declared war on, on, on Ukraine. So those would be some of the most important uh, aspects of human well-being, and it, it's, it's all getting better. Now, your second question is about why don't people uh, necessarily perceive that? And again, there is a massive amount of um, thinking and research on what, uh, what psychologists call negativity bias. And if you want, we can, we can talk about negative bias in, in greater detail. I th it's also politically interesting. One of the things I do here doing gun policy, everyone seems to think that it's worse now than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, or, and you have people who think it's less safe for kids to go out and, uh, and play in, in, on, in the streets or in the park you know, without supervision, that it's less safe, that kidnappings are more common. And so then you get this idea where it becomes politically salient and you have a president who ran on the idea of make America great again. Which seems to say that you know he, he's confirming that it was worse. It's, it's getting worse. It's everyone thinks it's getting worse. He's confirming it, and he's going to come in and fix this stuff. Uh, so it actually has meaningful political implications if people don't realize that things are getting better. So, so given given all of that, I mean, like, yeah, let's follow up on this this negativity bias, which is what Trevor has just described, but then described how people's negativity bias can be kind of operationalized or even weaponized in the political sphere. But what what is this bias and what drives it? Uh, it's there are, there are a number of aspects to it. The first one, the most obvious one, is that uh, um, uh, news is about stuff that happens. So shooting up a high school uh, is stuff that happens. Uh, the, you never have a journalist, again, as Pinker likes to say, uh, who is in the middle of a city that is at peace, say uh, Luanda, the capital of, uh, um, of of Angola, which had civil war for something like two or three decades. And you never have a journalist standing there. I'm, I'm reporting to you from a city that is not at war. Uh, they tend to go to places where terrible things happen. So, and and you know, it's in the nature of news that that uh, what bleeds leads. Okay, so th that's uh, one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is that um, bad and good news. Uh, tend to happen along two different time dimensions. Uh, good stuff tends to happen in incremental step over a long period of time. Let's take something like HIV drugs, uh, antiretroviral drugs. I mean, uh, we started talking about HIV AIDS in 1980. Um, it was only in 1994 that we have the first antiretroviral drugs. They have terrible side effects and so on and so forth. Um, today in 2018, um, uh, things are much better, but again, it took you know 28 years to get to a point where HIV/AIDS is no longer considered to be either a death sentence or a terrible impediment in terms of how people live their lives. So it's incremental. On the other hand, bad news or bad things uh, tend to happen very quickly. Um, you know, airplanes flying into skyscrapers. Um, second, uh, thirdly, uh, you've got a problem with bad being more powerful than good. Uh, which is to say that people tend to feel a loss uh, much more than they tend to feel uh, gain. Um, I like to think of my annual reviews with my boss um, where he can give me uh, a, a 10 minute narration about all the successes that we have committed. But it's that one thing that I messed up that, that he brings up that sticks with me for, for the whole year until the next uh, annual review, you know? And, and uh, the, the reality is that people uh, feel loss much more than much more than gain. So, you know, uh, that's a problem. What are the other ones? The availability heuristic. Um, 
terrible things um, have a greater imprint on our minds and we tend to pull them up from that from that memory folder with greater ease than good things um, and uh, you know because I like um, evolution and because I think that so much of uh, human uh, human persona and um, humanity is really uh, a, a result of how we have evolved, I, I think that there is probably a very good reason why we tend to be pessimistic and why we are on the lookout for bad things. And that's because that that paid off um, in, in the in the in the years of yore, uh, namely, that an overreaction to uh, to a perceived danger was less costly than underreaction to perceived danger. If you overreacted to, uh, I don't know, uh, a a, uh, um, uh, a noise, and it turned out to be and uh, to turn out to be benign, well, nothing happened. You just got you just got a little freaked out. But if there was a lion hiding behind that bush uh, and made the noise, and you didn't react, uh, you underreacted, then then you were dead. And so, optimistic genes uh, presumably would have been weeded out of the gene pool. So those those explanations tend to focus on. The behavior of like we so we we kind of notice like you said we notice the bad stuff more the bad stuff sticks more in our memory um, we have this incentive to if we're not quite sure to assume it's bad because it's a survival thing but but there seems to be this other phenomenon that would that doesn't quite get explained by those but but seems very widespread and and somewhat troubling which is that someone comes to say a site like Human Progress so you you think things are bad. But you ought to then be really happy to find out that things aren't bad, mm -hmm. right? Like you, it ought to be great. Like so, someone tells you, like, "Oh, that noise was just the wind; it wasn't a lion." You ought to be, you know, just yay, that made my day. But it seems that people's reaction to being told it was just the wind and not a lion is to get mad at the person telling them, or to get mad at you, or to say that you know you're trying to push some agenda, or things really are. It's like people want to hold on to the badness too in light of all the evidence in you know against all the evidence to the contrary when it seems like we all want to why wouldn't you want to like know that the world is better than you think it is that seems like the best possible thing that you could know well let's explore that a little because actually i could use your help in thinking through this um so what we are talking about right uh, so far is what I call the software of negativity, um, the, the programs that are being run in our minds, uh, how to react to things. Then there's also hardware of negativity, and that's the amygdala. There's actually a part of our brain that is responsible for rage and fear and things like that, and that's part of it. Environment also plays a role. Um, and don't worry, I'm going to get to the point that you were making. But um, environment also plays a role. So, for example, social media en enables us to um, um, to 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 feel um, negative news much more immediately and much more intimately. Uh, you can watch a tsunami kill 10,000 Japanese on your, you know, in real life. It, of course, you makes you feel uh, very unsafe. But now let's get to the last point. So I've talked about hardware, amygdala. I was talking about software, the psychological processes, the environment. But let's talk about something else, and that's philosophy, or, or, or rather, um, uh, maybe ideology. Okay. So let me give you an example of of what I mean, and maybe you too can opine. There is this man called Graeber who started the whole We Are the 99%. Uh, and uh, the story was told to me by uh, uh, Charles Kenny of um, Center for Global Development. And basically, this guy, Graeber, um, sent out a bunch of tweets about a year ago asking people to provide him with basically evidence that the world is getting worse. And, and his tweets went something like this. I keep seeing um, statistics um, which are showing that the world is getting better, um, and and this seems to confirm the validity of what he called neoliberal order. Okay, which is basically what I'm saying is that capitalism is not bad, right? Um, does anybody know any statistics to counter that? And can anybody supply me with those statistics? Okay, so here you have a person who did what you, Aaron, um, what you were driving at. Okay, here you have a person who is um, uh, who is philosophically 
committed to a certain vision of the world, which is that to the extent that the world is dominated by free market capitalism, everything must be going to hell because we know that capitalism produces hellish outcomes, right? And and a person like Graeber will then uh, actively ignore positive news and search for news to um, to confirm his opinions. And I have seen this happen before. I don't see it happen amongst normal people, uh, ordinary people. I see it happening amongst smart people, intellectuals, who um, who come to who come to the table with a preconceived notion, capitalism bad, let's find the evidence for it. Do you think this is happening? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it, you can certainly, I mean, one reason you could see it happening among, say, intellectuals is that intellectuals have a public brand, so to speak, right? And so if you've built your public brand, it would be the same as like, so a scientist who has built her career around advancing a particular theory, um, she'll say, you know, I my ultimate commitment as a scientist is to discovering the truth um, and, and discovering how things really are. But if people come along with evidence that the theory that she's built her career around is not, maybe is not as good as she thought, the inclination to fight that because you basically like, if, if you're wrong, not only are you wrong and none of us like to be wrong, but you have been discredited um, you, you know, you're you're no longer kind of the the expert or the person that you've presented yourself as, and so in the ideological space, that certainly makes sense. Like, you know, I would naturally my inclination would be to push back against evidence that libertarianism is wrong or bad or makes the world worse. Um, in part because I, you know, we push back on stuff we don't immediately believe, but also because I have built a career at the Cato Institute and in advancing a set of ideas. And if it turns out I was advancing the wrong ideas, that's going to hurt. Um, and so hopefully, you know, you can do a good job of not letting those things. But that makes sense within mm. that context. We uh, also see environmentalists, I think, probably have a difficult time believing that many environmental indicators are getting better. Uh, if, if it's the case that runaway capitalism, if their belief that consumption is what's going to destroy the environment, uh, th that's a hard one to believe. I've seen it in debates about – this happened in Boulder when Aaron and I were at Boulder. Campus, the campus rape question where I remember a specific instance well, – that, this occurred you know, recently but also years ago of like how many women are being raped on campuses. And it, many people on the quote-unquote feminist side of that, but I don't like that characterization, but on the uh, pushing that agenda want that number almost – it seems like they want the number to be as high as it possibly can. I mean I don't, I'm putting want in scare quotes. They don't want women to be raped. But if you say I think, you know, I think your one in four women is a little bit inflated, but one in four women – confirms the patriarchy and how much women are, are oppressed by men, right? And so, I mean, it, but so it's, what if it's like one in nine, which is still a huge problem, uh, but they would get mad at like some other study that said it might be less. So I think Aaron's exactly correct. I, but I, I guess I would push back. So you said we see this among like kind of this intellectual class or the professionals or these certain people with expertise or whatever, but not among ordinary people. But I think I think we do see it among ordinary people. Oh, yeah. I mean, Absolutely. Trump, Trump's entire campaign. So Trump would fit. I mean, not the public intellectual side of things, but he, he'd fit the model of someone who's building, you know, a professional career around this. You know, everything's bad. But his voters were very convinced, remain convinced that America is going to hell um, and that everything's getting worse. And they are ordinary people. Um, and and I wonder how much of it is, you know. So I, I remember a discussion on Twitter a while back. Um, I think it was Robin Hanson asked why it was that science fiction was always about dystopias, that it wasn't about utopias. That makes me, um, makes me crazy. And, <laughs> and the, to me, the, the answer the, the answer is obvious: is because if you're telling a story, you need conflict. A story without conflict is not a very interesting story. And a world where everything is perfect doesn't have any conflict in it. And so, it simply is more interesting to tell stories in a dystopia where there's conflict baked into everything than in a happy-go-lucky, everyone is nice to each other world. So it's just bad storytelling um, is utopia equals bad storytelling. And and I think that there's a there's a I want to say there's a sense of that in our own lives. Like we, you know, like to see ourselves as kind of part of a narrative. We have a narrative of our lives. And this, you know, we are the ones like it's it's always it's always like things are bad, but like 
I I can I'm one of the few who can see how bad they are, and I'm one of the few like I can do something about it. I can vote for that guy, or I'm the one who's out changing the world. So you're kind of making yourself the central character in this du- dystopian fiction, whereas like saying, "Well, things are good, and I'm just kind of part of it," doesn't make you feel as important, um, or with that sense of purpose of like I'm going to strive to overcome this awful stuff, um, and which on the one hand can be good. Like we should, it's good that I think we're motivated to try to make the world better or want to overcome obstacles. But if we're kind of overcoming imaginary obstacles, and especially if we're in the process of doing so, we're making things worse. Then that's a pretty poor application of it. But I do think there's this kind of natural tendency to want to see some conflict or to like well, it. One last point on that. Uh, in the personal narrative you're telling, one thing that you see is nostalgia bias. I mean, so many people are like, man, the world was so much better when I was between 12 and 20 years old. I'm like, yeah, what a shock. Like, you know, you were being taken care of by other people. Like, you didn't have a care in the world. But, that, but that's a very common belief too. Yeah, nothing is uh, as responsible for the good old days as bad memory, right? Um, the one qualifier to, to human progress, which ties to what you are saying, Aaron, is that um, uh, human progress is not linear. It is not. Um, uh, it is not universal in a sense that um, yes, the world on average is getting better, but. That doesn't mean that everyone in the world is getting better. Um, I keep on quoting Pinker just because I guess um, I, I was so heavily influenced by him and also because uh, he's a member of, of my board. But um, he likes to say that uh, if everything was getting better for everyone everywhere, that wouldn't be progress. That would be a miracle, right? And so we are not in a world of mir- miracles. And uh, it may well be that the crucial aspect to Trump's victory was um, that we did have a very deep recession, uh, that the economy was quite sluggish uh, for a very long time, uh, that a lot of people felt left behind, that um, you had uh, the rise of the opioid crisis, which means that in America today for the second or the third year in a row, I think maybe third year in a row, uh, we have life, life expectancy, which is uh, which has declined by about a month. Okay, so uh, we need to acknowledge that, and I think we we all would that uh, countries can uh, can go through these dips, uh, so to speak, and maybe uh, Trump's election just came at a time when people were feeling uh, in a bit of a in a bit of a funk. That does not detract from the fact that an American today is much better off than an average American was uh, 20 years ago, 30, 40, or 50 years ago. Uh, Life is improving uh, along a lot of dimensions, and those are quite impressive. It's just that the line of progress is a jagged one. You know, if you're going to compare your, uh, let's say that you are comparing your standard of living in 2009 to your standard of living in 2007. Was there a dip? Yes, there was, but we bounced back. The issue is to step back and to look at the um, uh, at the curve of human progress over a longer period of time. Don't you know? Uh, it goes for just about everything. It goes for uh, car accidents. It goes for sh- school shootings. You really need to or crime. You really need to go back and look at a couple of decades and see which way things are heading. The, the curve of human progress is a jagged one. You've just uh, released a, a new index called the Simon Abundance Index. Uh, what is that? Uh, where did it come from? And, and what does it tell us? Thank you very much. So <laughs> I guess we are shifting to uh, uh, the part of the debate which is uh, also centering on, on, on criticism of economic development and how uh, um, everything will uh, – that we cannot sustain progress. Sustainability right? is – a word that in the last 20 years is a part of every conversation. I'm not even sure exactly what it means, but yes, sustainability. Yeah, that you know, <laughs> th- there's certainly a part of the um, uh, of the clarity that acknowledges that things have gotten better, but now the argument is that that cannot possibly that cannot possibly last, and everything is going to end up in tears anyway, and. Um, That leads us to the Simon Abundance Index. Now, the Simon Abundance Index and the Simon Project, which we'll be launching soon, is uh, 
based on the work and in memory of Julian Simon, who was a senior a fellow at Cato before he died in 1998. And he was the original optimist. He was the original optimist. I cannot stress this enough because in the 1960s, the 1970s and the 1980s, when things really seemed to be going very poorly, you have the uh, quadrupling of the oil price in 1974, I think it was. Then you have the oil embargo in 1979. And... Uh, 70s in general seemed like a um, like a very fertile ground for the opinions of people like uh, Paul Ehrlich and his famous uh, book, uh, The Population Bomb, which came out in 1968 and uh, which seemed to confirm, and, and, and then the subsequent events in the 1970s seemed to confirm his biggest worries, which is that, which is that um, a rise in population uh, was going to result in depletion of natural resources and then widespread global famine and economic collapse. And and Simon really opposed that. He was the central figure in opposing that during the 70s and the 80s. And what Simon was saying was, no, that's not going to happen for the following reason. Uh, with every hungry mouth uh, comes a pair of hands and the mind, uh, minds which are capable of innovating our way out of scar scarcity. So human beings are really quite different from all the other animals because we can innovate our way out of shortages. And in that sense, Simon actually believed that the more people we have, the better, because uh, and every additional billion of billion people will bring with it a certain number of Einsteins and Newtons and uh, Lou Pasteur's and things like that. And so um, what Simon argued was that we are not going to run out of resources. In fact, resources are going to become cheaper. And he and Ehrlich uh, had a famous bet, which started in 1980 and ended in 1990. Ehrlich was asked to pick five commodities. He picked uh, Tin and I, I think he picked zinc and tungsten, maybe copper. I, nickel, maybe. Nickel, yeah. yes. And um, if the price went up in the succeeding decade, Simon would pay him. If the price went down, then Early would pay Simon. Well, at the end of those 10 years, um, the, the, the real price of resources fell by something like 57%. And... Um, Ehrlich sent Simon a check for something like $570 or something. Now, Simon and Ehrlich only looked at real prices of resources. In other words, they adjusted the price of nominal prices of resources by inflation. And that's valuable, but we felt that it was insufficient for the following reason. And that is that incomes tend to increase at a faster pace than inflation. As Individual people become more productive, they earn more money, and then humanity as a whole, on average, becomes more productive with time. And so wages tend to increase and income tends to increase at a faster pace than inflation. So what's really important is to see how expensive resources are relative to income. And so what we calculated was that if in 1980, which was the starting date of the original wager, and 2017, um, Hourly income per uh, average hourly income of a notional uh, inhabitant of the world increased by something like 80%. So, relative to the hourly income, the price of resources, which we call the time price of resources, because we are trying to price resources in terms of time that you need to work in order to earn enough money to buy a resource. So we found that time prices of resources have fallen by 65%. So just to make it a little less verbose, um, in our basket of 50 commodities, which includes chicken, um, zinc, uranium, oil, gold, platinum, what have you, there are 50 of them, this basket of commodities uh, became 65% cheaper, which means that what took you 60 minutes of work 
to buy in 1980 took only 21 minutes of work to buy in 2017. Who's the you in that? Because what what I can buy in 21 minutes of my work is very different from what Jeff Bezos can buy in 21 minutes of his work. So is this – was it 65 percent cheaper? It can't be for everyone or was it 65 percent cheaper for a bunch of people who make a, a bunch and then not necessarily cheaper for the people who don't have as much income? Mm. So what we did was to use the World Bank's um, – per capita incomes. Uh, the World Bank uh, traces uh, per capita, average per capita income in the world uh, from I think it's uh, 1980 or perhaps even go, goes back to 1960. Um, and we have adjusted it by number of hours worked because the numbers of worked by a typical laborer in the world is actually declining. It has declined by something like 9% over the last 37 years. So. We looked at that average per capita income as tracked by the World Bank, adjusted by the number of hours worked, and that's what gave us the 80% increase in hourly income. So, who would be um, who would be making that money? It would be that 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 notional person um, in, in the middle of uh, global income distribution. Let's say somebody living in uh, I don't know Indonesia. I think Brazil is like the average. The income for like the whole world, I think, is a deodorant device. And then I, I'm imagining someone who is not as optimistic about all these trends um, and maybe on the environmentalist side saying, so like if – isn't this isn't this bad if this stuff is getting cheaper? Because say we're not making more oil. There's only so much oil. Um, and if oil has suddenly become 65 percent cheaper than it was, doesn't that mean we're just going to burn through the oil that we have even quicker because people are just going to be buying even more of it? Oil is a bad example because the earth continues to produce oil. <laughs> but never mind. Um, you, you can certainly make that case for, say, copper. Yeah, you can certainly make that case for, for copper or gold or platinum or whatever. Um, and, uh, and yes, um, the, the, there are people who are arguing that the increasing abundance of resources is something to be worried about because that contributes to increasing consumption. Um, so, um, but, but that's a second uh, objection. That's a separate objection, uh, something that we will no doubt be working with in the future. Um, and uh, my, my initial comment about that is twofold. One is that um, let's look at the problem of consumption from the perspective – from moral as well as practical perspective. The first is the moral perspective. Uh, here in the West, we have obviously reached a certain level of, uh, of abundance. You know, on average, people are living, um, historically speaking, uh, very prosperous lives. And it would be a mistake uh, or rather it would be quite immoral in my view at least to deny that sort of economic development to people in the developing countries, in poor countries. It's, it's, I, I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a starting point to say to the Prime Minister of India, I think that we should – that you should cap your uh, per capita income at $2,000 a year because, you know, it will be bad for the planet. So that's a non-starter. These, these countries are never going to put up with that. Um, so let's then switch to developed countries or rich countries. And here, I think that the problem is one of democracy, um, combining uh, combining limits on consumption with uh, democratic decision making. What is Paris all about right now? The, 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 the tremendous outpouring of animus toward the governing elites, toward Macron, etc. What broke the, uh, the proverbial back of the camel was uh, an attempt by Macron, since reversed, to impose new taxes on, on gasoline. Um, that comes on, uh, on the heels of, uh, of an already stagnating economy with very high taxation. Um, and uh, what we have seen in Europe, not so much in the United States, but what we have seen in Europe is this very difficult combination. On the one hand, you've got economic stagnation or 
or growth, which is maybe at best half the rate of what we have in the United States. Um, but we do have increasing demands on the income uh, of a typical European, uh, increased taxes for uh, um, utilities, for example. Um, a friend of mine just came back from England. His parents lived near Oxford. Uh, they spent, and they have the, the house, modest house, that's just two retirees living together. Uh, they have a, uh, they run it on gas. Uh, most of their utilities are sort of gas oriented. They spend 15 pounds a day to, to heat their house in the middle of winter. Uh, now that amounts to $450, uh, sorry, 450 pounds per month. What, what, what about $500? Uh, a month. So what what there has has emerged in Europe is the concept of uh, energy poverty, where people in the first world, uh, people who are driving fancy cars and are able to communicate with one another on uh, you know sophisticated technology and so on, cannot heat their homes because uh, the the price of heating has become prohibitively expensive. But just because of taxes, not because, because of, of taxes. resources yeah. price going up. That's right. My my energy bills come to about fifty dollars. Uh, my my gas bill is about fifty dollars. So that's one tenth of what it is in 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 Europe, and so um, people are in revolt, and so the question once again becomes: uh, How do you deal with consumption limits within democratic context? And the answer is that if it's a question of limiting consumption, and or or winning the election, it's one or the other, right? So then. I think that really the fallback position has to be, we are not, realistically speaking, we are not going to limit consumption. What we have to figure out are ways in which uh, we can produce energy more cheaply, um, come up with technologies which use less energy, um, sort of techno-optimist answer to the question of consumption rather than a command uh, answer to the, command and obey answer to consumption. Well, it also seems that with Aaron's question about sustainability, or we we might run out of copper. I remember there was a copper shortage about ten years ago, maybe, mm -hmm. and the price went up, and people started using other things other than car yeah, copper. So, yeah, so the yeah, amazingness yeah. of conservation occurred. Also, people would steal the copper wire out of the box behind where I was living. Yeah, at the they time. would, they, or go to houses and steal the pipes out of the thing. But people would also go and buy copper from those houses, say, I'm going to switch over to steel rather than copper. And then I haven't heard about the copper shortage since. So the price does indicate its scarcity or its perceived scarcity right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in this paper, we don't look at the availability of resources from the point of view of quantity. Uh, that's what engineers do. We look at it from perspective of, of price which is what economists do, because at any given point in time, the price reflects the totality of human knowledge um, as to the availability of that particular resource. Now, um, in terms of copper or anything else, you know, let's take the most famous example, and that's the rare metals. Um, rare earths, sorry, rare earths, uh, which uh, which China is uh, is a huge producer of. So there was this uh, diplomatic incident in 2011, and uh, between Japan and China, and China decided we are going to uh, we are not going to export rare earths to the rest of the world, um, you know, as a punishment. And the price has skyrocketed, um, and since then it has collapsed, and it has collapsed because the market forces have reacted to um, to a very high price of the resource by looking at ways around it. And uh, partly what happened was that when the price went up, uh, people had more of a fiscal incentive or a profit incentive to go and search for new deposits of, uh, of rare earths. And they found them actually. There, there's this patch of earth of just off the coast of, of Japan, which is supposed to contain 800 years worth of um, uh, rare earths, and that was discovered only last year. Um, people have come up with substitutes. People have become more judicious when using something or other. And the reality is that, as I said, 50 foundational commodities, all of them are cheaper than uh, than what they were in uh, in 1980. I think that uranium was the biggest uh, decline, and that has declined in price by 95%, which is quite extraordinary. So you're an optimist about things, uh, probably mo many things, humanprogress.org. Uh, what are you pessimistic about? 
Well, I don't discount the possibility of some sort of a um, um, of, of existential threats. They could be as as simple and commonsensical as uh, a nuclear conflict between superpowers. Uh, one thing which I would like to discover, and I encourage all of your listeners to come back to me on that, is if anybody has done a, a research on how many nuclear bombs or how many kilotons of, of nuclear um, stuff could go off uh, for the world to survive, because uh, it would be quite an interesting, um, quite an interesting research project for for physicists. Because for the following reason, um, at the height of the Cold War, the world had something like uh, um, goodness, uh, what is it, forty five, uh, maybe seventy? No, you, you're right. It was over seventy thousand nuclear warheads. We are now down to roughly five thousand, I think. And it would be very interesting to see. Um, how far would we have to reduce um, the number of warheads possessed by individual countries in the world for them to still keep the deterrent, but but uh, basically ensuring that if there is an accidental conflict, uh, all the nukes could go off and we would still survive as a species. So this would be a very interesting sort of an intellectual exercise. Um, so nuclear war is a, is a good example. Um, an asteroid, uh, I know it sounds like uh, sci-fi, but you know, if, if, it, if the asteroid is big enough and we, we find about it. But then we need the nuclear weapons, if, at least well, if Armageddon so. taught me anything. Well, I, but if we spot it late enough, um, you know, all, all the nukes in the world would probably not help us. I, I don't know if they would. Um, I'm not, particularly worried about uh, germs, uh, because I think that uh, technology today enables us to break down the DNA of any kind of virus uh, very rapidly, and we'd be able to react to it very quickly. So I'm not particularly worried about that. Uh, but certainly an accidental war uh, would be something that would, that would greatly worry me. What about political trends? Um, political trends. So... <laughs> there is this debate between me and Andrei Ilarionov, uh, my esteemed colleague, um, who who thinks that democracy is uh, in decline. And certainly, um, if you look at the data from uh, the Freedom House, uh, it's, it looks like the number of democracies has experienced a slight dip in the last decade or so. But then if you look at uh, data from the Center for um, Systemic uh, what is it? The Systemic Peace, Center for Systemic Peace. Uh, they do something something different. Instead of assigning free, unfree, or partly free to individual countries, they give each country a, a, a score from minus 10 to plus 10. And once you add up all the po positive scores, um, and once you add up all the negative scores, you actually see that democracy um, is at an all-time high. Now, to, to simplify that point, you could certainly have a situation where one country gets a dictator, let's say Erdogan in uh, Turkey, but two or three countries improve from scoring six to scoring eight. And so on balance, the people in those countries that have improved the quality of their democracy will be uh, will be better off, uh, and that will offset the number of people in Turkey who have gone from living in a partially free society into a, to, to a dictatorship. Um, put it differently, in 1989, which was the last year of communism, roughly half of humankind lived in uh, in democracies. Today, it's two thirds of humankind. So even though democracy is certainly not expanding in the way that, uh, that it was during the 1990s, uh, it's still a much better situation than what it was in the 80s or for that matter in the 70s. I think in the 70s was, was really the, the nadir of, of democracies in the world. Um, now, then the question becomes, well, can political freedom continue to expand Indefinitely, well, it certainly can expand, but not indefinitely. I mean, at, at some point, um, you know, diminishing returns will kick in and it will be very difficult to um, to scoop up the places that are not democratic. Um, but 
even last year, as 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 Turkey became uh, became uh, became a dictatorship, um, Nigeria became a democracy for the first time. Uh, this most populous of African countries has actually experienced a, uh, a peaceful transition of power through democratic means from uh, a party that was into opposition to become party of government. Now, I didn't see that coming, and it was pretty cool because uh, because Nigeria, by 2050, there will be more Nigerians than Americans. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please rate and review us on iTunes. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.